It's our turn now to take bedside ultrasound and put it under the microscope. Dr. Liz Turner has been evaluating both the educational curriculum and actual outcomes in evaluating the utility of bedside ultrasound. Dr. Turner, welcome. Tell us a little bit about, about your background and what you're doing right now. All right, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm Liz Turner. I'm the director of bedside ultrasound for the Department of Medicine at UCLA. And what we're doing is we are implementing a program of training for our fellows and also for our residents and hospitalists and other people at UCLA trying to get a program of bedside ultrasound up and running. And I've done some studies around that over the last couple years. One when I was at UC Irvine and now one where I'm at UCLA, which is a continuation of, of the first project. Um, but I'm, I'm just the enthusiast and those of us who use bedside ultrasound are very passionate about it and we really want to see this take hold. So what we're doing at UCLA now is an outcome study, a patient outcome study. We've already looked at the curriculum and we put our fellows at, uh, at UCLA through the curriculum we studied at UC, UC Irvine. But the UC Office of the President was interested in taking it one step further and saying if we do this, if we, if we put the in, you know, effort into training all these people, is it going to actually make a difference for the patient in the end? Because that's the bottom line for hospitals a lot of times. And so we designed a study so that we're going to take all comers um, who come into the medical ICU who have a diagnosis of shock, and shock of any sort. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, distributive shock, it could be cardiogenic shock, septic shock. Um, so if you have shock, you're going to be randomized to one of two groups. One group gets a bedside ultrasound rush study, which is rapid ultrasound in shock. It's a protocol. Um, they're going to get the rush study within 24 hours of their shock diagnosis. The other group is going to get usual care. And so usual care may include a bedside ultrasound if the attending or fellow thinks about it, but it may also not. But one group is going to get a protocolized, mandated early ultrasound with a procedure note documentation in the record of what the findings were. And we're going to track these patients over the course of the year and see whether their length of stay is any different than patients who are managed without ultrasound, whether the cost of stay or End, end organ dysfunction or in the, the amount of resource utilization for labs and x-rays and other studies differs at all. We've talked about the intensivist and the role of bedside ultrasound in the ICU, but I'd like you to comment about its utility outside of, of the four walls of the intensive care unit. Right. Well, there, there's certainly applications outside the four walls, not only in the hospital, but in primary care as well. But I have been working with the hospitalist groups, not only at UCLA, but nationally. I uh, work with the Society of Hospital Medicine to, to start a training program uh, there. And they are now having a pre-course before their national convention to introduce hospitalists to the applications of bedside ultrasound for their purposes. And it's, it's sold out every year for the last three years. So I think it's becoming obvious to the hospitalists that these applications not only are relevant to their care, but it also might actually keep people from having to go to the ICU to figure out what's going on with them. If they can figure it out earlier, they might not get into trouble. You know, so I have been working with a few of the hospitalists. I've recently been talking to the residency program um, coordinator about developing a program for the residents, but we have decided that we need to train the trainers first. So we're really great. we have a, a core group of hospitals who want to be bedside ultrasound aficionados, and so I've trained two of them. We're training a few more, um, but they're very excited about it because they can see that you know a shorter breath patient who comes in, and they can figure out early: is this heart failure? Is this COPD? Is this asthma? Or is this a pericardial effusion? They can figure that out before the patient gets into trouble and oftentimes can save a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of heartache. Do physicians have access to ultrasound in their department? Uh, unfortunately, at this time, we don't have enough ultrasounds in the hospital to make it very readily available for everybody who wants to use it. At this point, as a lot of hospitals do, our, the ICU ultrasound gets borrowed mm. you know, outside the ICU by other groups who want to do procedures or want to take a quick look at volume status. And unfortunately, that leaves the ICU at a disadvantage when they need it. So I think one of the keys to making any program successful is having adequate equipment available for every group who's going to be using it. I want to just sort of wrap things up and talk about visual medicine from a 30,000 foot view. And you're feeling as a clinician the power of the visual assimilation of data, whether it be ultrasound or any other types of data. 
your, your thoughts on that and the future of this in clinical practice? Right. I practiced medicine for six years before I learned ultrasound. You can take vital signs, you can take touching the patient, you can take a history, but if but sometimes you can do all of that and you're still left with a differential diagnosis of three possible things. If you can put an ultrasound probe on that patient and narrow it down to one or two, that patient gets the care they need sooner, they get fewer unnecessary tests, they're gonna get out of the hospital sooner and they're gonna be happier with their care. We're all very excited about the data and thank you very much for taking the time, Dr. Turner. Sure.